Okay, so welcome, and uh, this is a talk about the 3D moon. So you need the 3D glasses, and if you've got them on correctly with the red lens on the left-hand side, you should find a magnificent view of the full moon. And if you move your head around, it really does look to be bulging out of the screen at you. So what you can see there is uh, the dark areas, the mare, the seas of the moon, uh, and then the lighter, younger areas where the surface has been turned over more recently. And basically the brighter a feature on the moon is, the less time it has been exposed to the ravages of the solar wind. And so the brightest feature on the moon is over to the uh, left hand side, roughly at the equator. That's that bright speck, the crater Aristarchus. And if you move off to the right, you've then got a couple of uh, older craters in the middle of the large dark area. The uh, left hand one is Kepler and the right hand one is called Copernicus, showing their lovely sort of spidery traces of the ejector. And then towards the south, the bottom of the moon, there's the very prominent and also quite young crater Tycho with its enormous uh, array of rays some of which, if you follow them, they can go almost right round the moon. And uh, that was the one that Brian was talking about last night that was dated to be, uh, I think, 107 million years old. And it's possible that the lump of uh, material that crashed into the moon there, this small asteroid that caused Tycho Crater, was from the same shower of material as hit the Earth 40 million years later and wiped out the dinosaurs. So it might be a sister impact of a, a rock from the same group. So anyway, there's the, the moon in 3D. Uh, it really does work stunningly well, I think. This one is the one that Hugh took, which is equally good, uh, slightly darker overall. And, and it, as you can see, the positioning is slightly different. We could see a little bit more down to the southern right hand corner of the moon and up at the top left Aristarchus is a bit nearer the edge. Now they say that the moon always keeps one side facing the earth and that's mostly true uh, because the moon spins on its axis in one month and it rotates around the earth in one month so it keeps the same face pointing towards us on average but because the moon's orbit is elliptical, they don't quite remain in phase with each other. When the moon is at its near point to the Earth, it moves a bit faster. When it's further away, it moves a bit slower. And so we actually get to see about 54% of the surface of the moon from the Earth. Now here is a picture taken out of the window of the surface of the moon taken out the window from the uh, uh, Apollo 8 spacecraft as it was uh, orbiting around the moon. It did a figure of eight, went out from the earth and around the moon and came back again and was the first uh, set of human eyes to see some of the terrain that we see here on the far side of the moon that we can't normally see at all from the earth. And this is a picture then from Apollo 11, which obviously went and landed on the moon, but this is taken from orbit, looking uh, from quite a low angle over the crater studded uh, features of the, the, the surface of the moon. And again, if you just move your head around, you really get a, a sense of the ruggedness of that surface. But of course, they, Apollo 11 then uh, separated into two components, the command module with Michael Collins on board stayed in orbit and Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong flew down and landed on the surface in the uh, Eagle uh, Lunar Lander module called the LEM, Lunar Excursion Module. The Americans have to have a three letter acronym for everything. And so perhaps one of the most famous photographs in history uh, was created. And this is one of Buzz Aldrin's footprints one that he deliberately made, he planted his foot in front of him and then stepped back and photographed it to try to see just how deep into the soil the foot would go as a measure of the 
strength of the lunar soil. Um, they were worried uh, really whether or not the uh, lunar module was going to sink into the moon as a result of uh, all the dust. But it turns out the dust layer is quite thin and then underneath that the subsoil very much uh, a sort of rocky subsurface that's uh, really quite strong. So here's the full moon again and we've got the Apollo 11 landing site nicely picked out for you in 3D there. You can see just where they landed in the middle of that, uh, well not in the middle, at the edge of that dark region which is the Sea of Tranquility. The uh, seas on the uh, side of the moon this side are all named after nice things so we've got the Sea of Fertility, the Sea of Nectar, the Sea of Tranquility and the Sea of Serenity on this side and then on the left hand side the sinister side of the moon all, all of the features are named after uh, rather nastier things in general so Mare Imbrium this big impact basin here that's uh, the Sea of uh, storms and this is the marsh of rot here that uh, Brian was talking about yesterday in our moon watch and so on but anyway that's where the Apollo 11 landing site is quite near the equator on the moon because actually that's much easier to reach um, if you think about it we're coming from the direction of the earth and so the natural tendency is to go into an equatorial orbit around the moon and it uses more fuel to then try and change that to get into a, an orbit that goes any nearer the polar regions. So this is the command module of Apollo 11, the photograph taken with the moon in the background from the uh, lunar module as the two were separating and the uh, lunar module was going to head down to the moon. So it's looking back so Michael Collins is in the, one of the windows there looking out to see his two colleagues departing for their historic landing. And here's the lunar module. Actually, this is on its way back up to rendezvous with uh, the command module again. And you've got the Earth peeping over the limb of the horizon of the moon there, just to give you uh, something else extra in the shot. So a rather impressive view. Back down to the surface, this is the uh, one of the legs of the lunar module with the, the gold foil wrapped around the, the uh, mechanical leg there and the big wide pads because they were quite concerned about whether or not they were going to sink into uh, 10 feet of uh, lunar dust or not. So they wanted to spread the weight as much as possible. Uh, this is the crater right next door to them that uh, they nearly landed in. You can see it's a fairly shallow crater but there was only a five degree tilt that they could really tolerate uh, for the lunar module. If they'd come down and landed uh, on a slope any more than that then it would have made the uh, takeoff extremely difficult uh, if not impossible and they might have been stuck on the moon. So a very, very dangerous escapade in, in totality. Uh, they only had 30 seconds of fuel left, famously, because uh, Neil Armstrong took over manual control. Uh, the computer was bringing them down into a very uh, boulder-strewn area, which would probably have proved fatal. And so he took over and flew it for as long as he could to try and find somewhere flatter to put the spacecraft down. So here it is, Tranquility Base, with the Eagle Lunar Module sat on its four legs and the flag proudly deployed along with some of the instruments. And uh, again, you can move your head around and just get a sense of it. And you can see how flat that area really is. There's almost nothing, um, hence the magnificent desolation phrase that was used. There's a close up of uh, the uh, flag held up by a uh, rod along the top here. And this is not it flapping in the breeze because there is no breeze. This is just because they've unrolled it and it's been stuffed uh, on board the spacecraft um, and someone needed to iron it before putting it up really. So that's just the natural creases of it. 
um, before the conspiracy theorists start claiming this was flapping in the breeze. Um, and we've got the solar wind collector just next door there as well, which is an experiment they planted to measure the intensity of the solar wind arriving on the moon. And you can see just how many footprints they've made wandering around in that area as well. Uh, this is Buzz. Most of the photographs are of Buzz. Neil took most of the photos and therefore he's not in them very often. Um, so this is Buzz unloading the seismometer out of the equipment bay. You can see they've peeled back the uh, cover on the lunar module uh, base unit there and are pulling things out of drawers to go and deploy the various equipment. And you can also see how dirty his boots already are from all that lunar dust which uh, gets kicked up and then floats around in the near vacuum but loves to stick to things because it's uh, so dry it gets electrostatically charged quite quickly. Here again is one of the foot pads. This one's not working for me in 3D very well. So uh, we might move on from that one, but it's uh, certainly quite, a, as long as you look at the footprint in the foreground, it seems to be okay. Yeah, that's the trick. Look at the foreground footprint and then it's all snapped into focus. Um, so it's just another view underneath the lunar module. Here's Buzz again, taking some core samples and trying to drill into the moon. Um, quite difficult really because the moon's quite hard and you haven't got as much weight behind you uh, to uh, use the equipment so uh, you need to be very careful to try and get the thing to drill into the moon. Here's another shot of that nearby crater. Um, with deep shadow in there in one side of it just shows how how black things are. The thing is with no atmosphere on the moon the, the colours uh, well, the, the intensity of the light is very stark. Um, the daylight is much, much brighter than it is on the Earth because you're not having so much of it bounced and scattered away by trying to get through the uh, atmosphere on the way down. And that's the same reason why you can't see any stars in the sky because the exposure time for photographs to capture the surface needs to be very, very short. Um, otherwise the surface being so bright is overexposed. It's why the astronauts are wearing those uh, darkened or even gold covered um, visors. Here's another one of the instruments uh, sat deployed on the surface of the moon and uh, a panorama just going right out to the horizon. Another thing about being on the moon is you just can't tell how far th away things are because they don't get hazier as they go further away and out of focus and we get used to using that as a visual cue when looking at things on the earth that if they're a bit hazy they they must be a long way away but also if you look at the shadow and you see the shadow is about twice as long as the instrument is high so the sun's at really quite a low angle in the sky. And it was deliberate that they landed at what is effectively around the equivalent of uh, sort of breakfast time uh, in the long 14 day long lunar day, uh, which will then be followed by 14 uh, Earth days of lunar night. Um, so they landed early in the morning, not that long after lunar sunrise, um, long enough that the sun has warmed up the surface to a, a reasonable temperature so they didn't freeze but if they'd waited longer till uh, the lunar midday then it would have become so hot on the surface of the moon that uh, they wouldn't really have been able to survive it so pretty much all of the lunar exploration has been done in the relative cool of the just post lunar dawn now we've got another shot taken from uh, orbit of the crater uh, Mendeleev and it's a 313 kilometer crater with a huge chain of craters next to it where an object has come in and probably come either too close to the moon or too close to the earth and been torn by the gravity 
by the tidal effect of gravity into a whole lot of fragments ripped apart and then those fragments have come in and crashed into the moon one after another uh, in, in a great long line there uh, gradually getting bigger towards the far side. Now this is one of my favorite craters on the moon this is the Messier crater pair and we looked at this during our moon watch um, the uh, two craters one of them is clearly not round um, and the other one's got something going on very unsymmetrically to the side of it so what actually happened is that a, a asteroid came in at a very very low angle from the left of the diagram here hit the surface of the moon and skipped like a stone skipping on water and bounced gouged out that long elliptical trench lifted itself back into the sky and bounced 20 kilometers downrange and then crashed again making the second crater and throwing the ejector out to the right and uh, the, the, these craters are around about 10 kilometers in diameter each and their centers as I said are about 20k apart and so the uh, the object that came in and did this was probably around about um, one kilometer maybe a little bit smaller maybe 500 meters in diameter because the crater is usually about 20 times the size of the impacting object. So now we'll have a look at uh, Apollo 12 and where that landed. You can see it's over on the uh, left hand side of the moon, equatorial again for fuel reasons, and just south of the uh, Copernicus crater, but uh, just uh, in, far enough away from it to be on a, a very uh, low lying flat bit of the, uh, the mare there. So this is uh, November 1969 and they stayed there for one day seven hours and 30 minutes so uh, just over the 24 hours and brought back 34 kilograms of space rock with them on this mission and this is the view of the landing site again just from orbit we're looking at it from a low angle and you can see across into the large crater with the central mound in it there and a few of the smaller nearby craters uh, but this is the uh, landing site taken from the ground and again you wouldn't have wanted to have landed in that large crater that's just ahead of us or put one leg into the small one in the foreground on the left there because it would have tilted the, uh, the whole uh, ship over so here's Pete Conrad standing next to quite a big, uh, quite a deep crater on the ground there with uh, some instruments and uh, the uh, sample core driller again and what looks like a Tesco shopping trolley um, which the uh, uh, Americans gave some uh, complicated three letter acronym to but it uh, looks like it's got a teapot hanging on one corner doesn't it but it's the, uh, uh, the their equipment uh, stand that they, they would be able to move around because they didn't have any transport with them they were moving around on foot you can also see just how dirty his spacesuit is getting already with all that dust again kicked up to his knees look there he is again looking even grubbier uh, in this particular shot I think that's just the the image but you can see now in his visor the uh, view back and the photographer standing in the background who, who took the photograph so uh, it wasn't taken in a uh, studio you can see the uh, cameraman there but uh, way off into the background of these shots that's almost too difficult to see was another spacecraft here's a better shot that shows it and this is surveyor 3 one of the nasa robotic explorer missions that came to the moon and landed and uh, sent back images and data about the conditions on the moon this one landed in April 1967 just two years before the Apollo missions uh, finally made it to to land um, and 
they deliberately landed Apollo 12 near to Surveyor 3 because they were going to go and visit it and see how it had survived. It had long since ceased communication, but here again is Pete Conrad uh, standing next to uh, the uh, surveyor on the lunar surface. And what he did was he unbolted that camera from the uh, spacecraft and they brought it back with them so that it could be analysed to see just how uh, the uh, equipment being exposed to the conditions of the moon for a couple of years had uh, done any damage to the electronics and the equipment generally. It can also of course see back where he's walked across from the uh, lunar module and uh, they've got their radio dish and you can even see the flag there set up in the background. So that was Apollo 12. This is Apollo 13. Of course we don't have any pictures from uh, them walking on the surface of the moon for obvious reasons that uh, all they did was a flyby mission of the moon, looped around it and came back because of the disaster with the exploding oxygen tanks uh, while they were still in near Earth uh, uh, orbit. They were on their way to the moon already and there was a big question about whether to turn around and fire the engines and try and come straight back or get the free return which would take longer but uh, didn't need to fire the engines by looping around the moon. They wisely chose to loop around the moon because the engines were so badly damaged that had they lit them they would have uh, all died. So here's where Apollo 14 then landed, not very far from Apollo 12 actually, just uh, again slightly uh, more to the centre of the moon there than uh, Apollo 12 but still not far from that crater Copernicus. And this was 1971 and they stayed about the same length of time, one day nine hours and 30 minutes and brought back 42 kilograms of samples. Here's Edgar Mitchell with uh, the TV camera on a stand uh, being photographed. Um, so uh, there's a lot of these uh, people photographing people photographing going on. You can see how long his shadow is. This really was early in the lunar morning, again, to keep the temperature down. Uh, a large moon rock called Big Bertha. That's uh, quite a sport naming rocks on other worlds that NASA seems to uh, have a department dedicated to. That's the biggest Apollo 14 space rock that weighed in at nine kilograms and was brought, brought back. Um, and the tracks there are 28 inches apart. Those are the tracks of that shopping trolley uh, thing, the, the Modularized Equipment Transporter, or MET, as they called it. And again, here's Mitchell with the TV camera on its tripod. Uh, and again, just a panorama. There's the Apollo 14 lunar module with its uh, gold foil all around the base there. And the flag, of course, just sat on the, on the ground. And you can see they really didn't need to worry about sinking into the lunar soil. Those those pads have hardly made any impression at all. Now on the return they took this photograph of the earth and again I find you need to look at the foreground objects on the moon in order that the 3D effect works for the earth. If you try focusing on the earth itself it tends not to work but that's the the crescent earth rising over the uh, far limb of the moon there. And the big crater that's 87 kilometers across it's named after Lisa Meitner the uh, famous uh, physicist. So now we'll go on to Apollo 15 and this is the one that landed near the Sea of Rot up there or the Marsh of Rot um, and near Mount Hadley and that's uh, the ridge of mountains that's running along, running along here. This is called the Apennine Mountains here, running around, around the rim of the large impact basin, Mare Imbrium. Uh, there's that crater Plato that we looked at last night. And uh, 
Eudoxus and uh, Aristotle, is it? I think that uh, Brian pointed out over there. This one over here, this is Proclus, which again is one of these low impact angle craters where something came in from this direction on the moon and the ejectors mostly gone down range in that direction. And just there in the Sea of Fertility, you can see the tiny image of the two craters of Messier that we looked at. But if we look down from orbit on the Apollo 15 landing site, we've got this fantastic view. The little box is drawn as to where they came down. And the big mountains are the, the Apennine Mountains with the tallest mountain on the moon, Mount Hadley there, that uh, is uh, this, this peak here that they landed right next to. And this sinuous feature here that winds its way right past the landing site, that's the Hadley Rill, a collapsed lava tube. Uh, you can see it actually goes on quite a long way across the moon where lava once flowed underground in a tunnel and then the roof has fallen in. Here's a high resolution image of it. Uh, and again, you can see how deep that, uh, that Hadley Rill is. So here's Dave Scott saluting the flag um, of Apollo 15 when they landed. And that's uh, Mount Hadley in the background there. And what you can also see is these tracks next to him on the surface rather than footprints. And this is because the Americans finally got around to taking a car with them, the Lunar Rover, more of a golf cart than anything else. But uh, you can see they've clearly unloaded it and driven it already in that photograph. This allowed them to travel a bit further away from the lunar module. You can see it in the background there, the little tiny thing in the distance, and that shows how far they'd driven away. But they were still very nervous, and quite rightly so, in that they only went as far from the lunar module in the rover as they figured they could probably just about walk back in case it broke down. Obviously, it allowed them to go out in multiple different excursions in different directions, um, in the same time period and so they could explore more but they they were still limited by this how how far can we uh, walk back how much oxygen and how fit are we and can we make it back to the lunar module if this uh, thing dies on us they found some very interesting rock samples and they put the uh, little uh, thing on its tripod down there it's got these color swatches on there and uh, those were to calibrate the colour cameras so that you could take a photograph and you knew what colour they are and therefore could calibrate the white balance and the colours and so on and work out what colours things were on the moon. And the answer most of the time was black and white. But uh, one of the missions, uh, they very famously found some very orange soil. Um, and got very excited about that because it was the only thing with any colour on the moon. Here's the rover itself with the uh, big balloon tyres, four wheels, lots of equipment, antennae and so forth on it for communications and the, the lunar module sat in the background there. Now you can see uh, one thing on there already, you see these uh, mud guards just take note of the mud guards here um, because we're going to come back to that when we look at the next photograph after they've actually tried driving around in it a bit um, they've made a uh, field modification they've uh, taken the, ripped the covers off the flight manuals and gaffer taped them on to extend the uh, size of the mud guards because the wheels were throwing huge plumes of lunar dust up and over the top of the uh, whole thing and it was raining down on them. They were getting absolutely filthy and couldn't see where they were going. So uh, they used uh, gaffer tape. You can see, always take a roll of gaffer tape to the moon. You see it's been taped on onto the mud guard back there to try and stop it throwing all that material up. And that's Dave Scott there 
uh, tending to some equipment on the far side of it. This is the rolling hills uh, over looking towards Mount Hadley. We mentioned this, so we always imagine the moon as having these very spiky mountains, but really the mountains of the moon are quite uh, like rolling hills rather than sharp jagged mountains. A lot of the jagged mountains we have on the earth are the result of freeze thaw cracking uh, due to ice and snow shattering the rocks and creating the very sharp peaks that we see during this weathering process and that just doesn't happen on the moon so you don't get that same sort of uh, uh, alpine like features. Here they are uh, not doing gardening they're raking up some samples that they're going to dig down and collect from just under the subsoil and again you can see the rover in the background there. Uh, this is Hill Crater which they came across as they were traveling around in that region and then obviously they returned back to the spacecraft loaded up all their samples and returned. So that brings us to Apollo 16 here and you can see that they've landed on uh, for the first time on the highland area of the moon rather than landing on the mare. Um, they beginning to learn a bit more about the terrain on the moon and figured that it was safe enough that they would find a flat region even if they landed on these uh, supposed highland areas and indeed they did. Here is the view of the lunar module from Apollo 16 uh, sat on a really rather pleasant flat area. Um, it's not perfect but it's not any, really any worse than any of the others and again you can see they've been driving around in the lunar rover there leaving some tracks behind. Here is uh, the rover with John Young fiddling with some equipment on it again and one or two experiments that they've already unloaded onto the surface. Note they've now got proper mud guards rather than flight manuals. And so they uh, did their thing, collected more moon rocks and returned back to orbit. And this is the rendezvous photograph. The command module here is traveling towards them, ready for redocking and the flight back to Earth. And again, the Earth rising over the uh, um, limb of the moon there. So that brings us on to the last of the six Apollo missions to make it and land on the moon, Apollo 17, and that's gone up here onto the region on the boundary of the Sea of Serenity and the Sea of Tranquility, just up where the uh, line is pointing there. We looked at that area last night with the telescopes quite extensively. And uh, here they are on the moon doing what you do, saluting the flag, and there's the rover of course. And the highlands were slightly rockier. Uh, you can see the rover in the background there is quite a lot of uh, fairly large boulders sticking through the surface. So the terrain was a little bit different, um, but nevertheless, they got away with uh, their landing. Here's a very good um, fractured rock uh, that's cracked open in the heat. And uh, showing that some of the rough terrain. But the bit they happened to choose to land on was almost flat as a pancake, as you can see. Again, just move your head around, you'll get the 3D effect very nicely. There's a very artistic shot here, looking up at the Earth uh, over the top of the lunar module. And you get a nice view of some of the little rocket engines that they used for maneuvering those uh, four nozzled uh, units that there are on each of the corners of the lunar module there. This is Gene Cernan, the last man on the moon, uh, so far at least, and uh, he's taken standing behind the rover.
Another very large rock, not, not one they brought back with them. This one have been, would have been too big to lift. But again, that same device, the color camera calibration uh, units. And I think this is the region in which they found that yellow soil or orange soil, but we, we haven't got a photograph of that in 3D. Cernan again on board the rover. And you see how dusty his backpack is. Uh, the dust just gets everywhere. And Jack Schmidt with a very large rock. I think he wanted to bring it back with him. Jack was the only scientist to ever land on the moon. Um, the other five were all professional pilots and astronauts uh, by training. Uh, they had quite a lot of scientific knowledge, but uh, Jack Schmidt was a trained geologist and made quite a lot of good discoveries by using his geologist's eye to go, that rock looks interesting and unusual, and picking and choosing between which samples to bring back. So it just goes to show that actually sending a properly trained uh, geologist is well worth the, the effort. But of course, they only did this once they were confident that uh, one man could really do the flying. There's the rover in the background again, so they've, they've wandered away from it. And the East Massif, again, another rolling mountain slope. And it's really quite a long way away. You think that doesn't look very far, but it really is miles and miles across the, that terrain. It's just that distorting effect of there being no dust in the in the uh, atmosphere creating a haze that uh, makes distant objects look fuzzy it, so it looks sharp so your brain says that must be near um, and a strewn rock field again between us and some of the rolling hills in the background lunar rover would not have been able to get over this lot they'd have to go round it some really quite big outcrops One of the instruments right in the background there just gives you a sense of uh, something to do with the scale and you really can then imagine just how far it is to that mountain. Here's a picture with the rover front and centre again, some of the large boulders there laid out that they would have to avoid. And this is a view looking down onto the landing site and somebody has drawn in the uh, locations that they drove to in the rover. So they went quite a long way and almost up to the base of that large mountain there, uh, using the rover to transport themselves. And the little arrow points down to where the lander is. Uh, but you can see this spacecraft flying above there. So this was during that uh, post landing rendezvous phase when the uh, two spacecraft were going to rejoin dock and uh, fly back to earth. So that's really the goodbye shot uh, at the end of the last landing on the moon. We've got a few more shots taken from orbit. I love this one. This uh, Glocenius crater uh, has got these amazing lar collapsed lava tubes in the bottom of it, these rills in the foreground and some lots more craters then in the background with those sort of terraced edges that uh, we were talking about the other day. Uh, another large rock, I think we've had that photograph already, keep moving. Um, now we come on to some images taken by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a spacecraft in orbit around the moon looking down and re-photographing the Apollo landing sites 40, 50 years later. So here you can see the base unit of the, the thing with the four legs and the now empty fuel tank and rocket motor that they used to land on the moon. And then only the upper section of the uh, lunar lander lifted off from that, leaving its base unit behind to save weight and uh, that's still there on the surface and you can see where they've walked and where the rover has uh, been and they've deployed 
some equipment right over this side and I think this is the the parked up rover they parked it out of the way and used the camera on the rover to film their own liftoff hmm. uh, so that's the actually the Apollo 16 landing site and this one's the Apollo 12 landing site uh, where you can see the again the uh, descent stage is parked there with its shadow and you can see the uh, tracks leading out but of course these are foot tracks not rover tracks although they did have that shopping trolley with them so but it, they're much fainter than the tracks made by the rover itself and of course they have photographed all of the landing sites um, and you can see different bits of equipment you can see that there's lines going out here a little bit of equipment deployed far enough away from the spacecraft so that it wasn't destroyed when the uh, spacecraft blasted back off lifting the men back to orbit for their return journey um, so they, they deployed them out in different directions well away from the main spacecraft but while all those landings were going on the uh, sole occupant of the command module uh, sadly no one ever remembers their names except perhaps Michael Collins from Apollo 11 but uh, they were in orbit around the moon and taking lots of lovely photographs and quite a few of those have been processed into 3D so you can just imagine the view out of the window for uh, a day, day and a half while the uh, your two uh, co-travellers were down on the surface and all you've got to do is orbit around. Another view straight down taken by uh, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter this one viewing down into some nice craters and a particularly uh, deep crater although I think they've probably over emphasized it with the 3D here and gone a bit mad I don't think it's really quite as deep and sharp as it looks there but it's nevertheless quite an impressive crater it's uh, just three and a quarter kilometers wide and called hell q quake crater uh, fairly young in origin not been uh, overlaid by anything else impacting more recently again i think they've rather over egged the 3d effect on the mountains on the central peak of maunder crater on the left there they, the, again the mountains on the moon all of them are not really that tall and steep and sharp they're more rolling hills so I think they've overcooked the 3d effect uh, rather and then on the right there got a nice little feature of a wrinkle ridge in the middle of one of the uh, mare this is where the land around has shrunk um, as the things contracted the Schroeter Valley, the deepest valley on the moon, again probably a collapsed lava tube um, where the lava was flowing in a tunnel underground and then the roof fell in. And uh, during our moon watch last night we were looking for the uh, Alpine Valley, this uh, rift valley where there's a fault in the geology of the crust of the moon pulled apart so the land collapsed down in the center much as it's done in the great African rift valley on earth um, and again you can see the line of the fault and the line of what was a collapsed a further collapsed lava tube in the center of the rift there um, right down the middle so this is up near the north polar region of the moon some fantastic images again of uh, just some, a couple of craters there uh, showing just how uh, rugged some parts of the rims of the craters can get. They tend to be more rugged than the mountains and a great groove has dug something out of the ground here. Not quite sure what's gone on there, whether that was a collapsed lava tube before the crater came and uh, formed. And so there we are. Let's uh, really just leave you with a view in 3D of the Earth and the Moon. And this one was taken by the Galileo spacecraft after it had 
swung past the moon, took a shot looking back towards the Earth, and you've got the view of the far side of the moon there in 3D. It's the only one I've got of the, the far side in, in 3D, apart from a, one of those initial close-ups that we looked at. So there you go. That's uh, all we've got for this uh, 3D tour of the moon. I hope you've enjoyed that. And uh, we'll come back uh, in a couple of weeks' time with uh, another 3D extravaganza. We'll be going out into... Uh, deep space, looking at uh, some of the very, very beautiful objects out there, the nebulae and galaxies. Um, and these are very much uh, very beautiful to look at, especially in 3D. You really get a, a sense of the structure of them.